Good afternoon. Welcome to Citrus and the Bonitao Institute. My name is David Lindemann. I'm director of the Citrus Health Initiative. Welcome to our program and welcome to Citrus Research Exchange Seminar Series. This is our 20th year of Citrus and our 13th year of the Citrus Research Exchange. We're delighted to have you and welcome to joining us. Even though we normally are meeting in Sudar Jadai Hall on campus at UC Berkeley, this year we will be doing our program in the fall series virtually. Before we begin the talk, I would first like to highlight our upcoming Citrus events. The next Citrus Research Exchange will be held two weeks from now, Wednesday, September 15th, noon, which is the time for all of our programs. And it will be discussion on human robot collaboration for fruit harvesting with Professor Stavros Bojoskrits, who is Professor of Biological and Agricultural Engineering at UC Davis. Please be sure to check the Citrus webpage for any of the programs and for registration in advance uh, through our normal Citrus UC org uh, slash RE. This uh, presentation will be moving forward with a few specific uh, items. We are going to dedicate 40 minutes to our guest speaker today, followed by a Q&A period. Please put any questions throughout the session into the Q&A, and you should see the Q&A icon in your Zoom toolbar. Uh, if you click thumbs up, you'll bring your questions to the top, and we will facilitate those in the last 20 minutes of the session. So again, we will hold questions until that period and we will all be on uh, mute until that period of time. So let's move to our guest speaker, who is Professor Gerald Friedland, who is an adjunct faculty in the EECS program here and specializes in machine learning uh, and is working with us within not only Citrus Health, but across a number of our specific research areas. Uh, Dr. Friedland is the founder and CTO of Brainome Incorporated. Before that, he was a principal data scientist at Lawrence Livermore National Lab and also worked at ICSI, the International Computer Science Institute, for over 10 years. His work focuses on machine learning and multimedia signal processing, and he has been the lead figure behind Multimedia Commons Initiative, which is a collective of 100 million images and 1 million videos for research. Gerald has published over 250 peer-reviewed articles and published in uh, different books and other venues. And he has received his doctorate and master's degree from Freie University Berlin in Germany back in 2002 and 2006, uh, respectively. Uh, we are thrilled that Gerald is working with us in a number of areas, and you will see some of those specific research ap appointments and uh, topics throughout today's session. It's my pleasure and great honor to welcome Gerald Friedland. Thank you so much, uh, David. Um, I'm just going to do the technicalities first and share my screen um, and hope everybody can see the presentation. Um, okay, no complaints. Well, thank you so much for having me and um, uh, I, I'm, I'm blush from, from the intro. But um, so, so what I'm uh, going to present today is something that I pretty much uh, stumbled upon on, on surprise and, and just had to do it. And um, there is a bunch of papers about it at this point and also a demo, which I'm going to, uh, you know, suggest uh, to try out. And then also there's a tool you can install yourself and play around with. So um, again, I'm, I'm actually mostly a multimedia researcher doing, doing video analytics and uh, sort of finding, you know, uh, internet videos, for example, based on the content rather than based on text. Um, but in my career, I started machine learning in 2001, and so mostly as a you know practitioner. Um, and as I said, one of the as as as, uh, as uh, David Lindemann said, one of the things that um, uh, I released was uh, 100 million images and uh, a million videos for research, so people could actually do field research without <laughs> leaving the house. Um, and as you know, students and me and and, and uh, other researchers worked on this. Um, we often um, we often had to ask for compute time, and also people were very scared of how how big would these experiments become if you work on 100 million videos or 100 million images. And 
this is how this started. And I'm going to give you a little more formal actual story how this started in a bit. But before I, before I go there, I wanted to just give you a structure of the talk. So this talk is going to be basically three parts. The first part is measurements in, in machine learning conceptual. So it's a little bit of you know ideas and theory. And then the question will be, OK, so now that I dragged you through all that ideas and, and thinking, so what, right? So why do you actually care? And why did nobody care so far? What is new about this? Why would this even help? Um, isn't this all self-organizing? And then the next question is, OK, so maybe maybe <laughs> I, I convinced you. But then how can you use this stuff? And of course, I'm going to show you that there's a demo. And then there's also a tool you can actually install right away and, and, and start using it. And then also there's a bunch of new research, I think, that comes out of that that would be very interesting uh, to pursue. So now let's get to the real story. The real story started again when students in my group um, basically wanted to do a deep learning experiment on, on, on sort of combining images and, and video and, and time data. And it seemed like a big experiment. So, you know, we asked Amazon, uh, I asked Amazon, they have, they're very friendly. Um, can you give us some research time, some, some compute time, right? So we need to do some research. And they asked one simple question. They said, okay, how much? And it was really interesting that the simple question of how much money do you need for an experiment was completely unanswerable by me. Um, and of course, what I do is I, I Google it. And then I see, for example, if you look at the state of the art in, in, in image uh, uh, sort of recognition, ImageNet, you see that different approaches there that are within very few percent difference in accuracy have very different sizes. For example, there's AlexNet is a 238 megabyte model and it needs like 2.27 billion operations to train. Darknet is a factor 10 smaller, but only needs a factor three less billion operations to train. And there's VGG16, which is not only, it's, it's twice the size, but then needs 10 times more operations to train. And when you, you know, when there's some variance, that's fine, but when you get orders of magnitude off, then it's really hard to predict, should I tell Amazon $10,000 worth of EC2 time or 100,000 or maybe a million? That didn't seem right. Um, something, something was wrong there. And I mean, you know, it, it worked because right now is a very, you know, full of cash business, but in reality, something isn't right. So what can you do about this? And in some way, um, I, I got reminded again and again that Grace Hopper is one of the famous computer scientists, early computer scientists, um, gave her little strings of um, wire to tell people, you know, how long it takes for a nanosecond versus a microsecond. Um, and because she needed to convince people that actually measurements are important. And what she said was that one accurate measurement is worth a thousand expert opinions. And so I asked myself, okay, what should we measure? How can we measure? How, how would this even work? Like, how do you actually measure the size of something you don't even know, you don't even have a model for? Let's start with a little game, with an intuition. Um, if I give you the sequence two, four, six, eight, Pretty much everybody, and I know this is not as interactive as I want it to be if I was in lecture hall now, pretty much anybody would say, well, the next number is 10. And the next number after that is 12. And the next number after that is 14. Why? Well, because in your brain, or that's what the brain does, you extract a rule. You say it's all even numbers or it's plus two. If I give you the sequence 6514, you'd say, well, I'm not necessarily sure I don't know, I haven't figured it out yet. Well, this is true because 6514 is the last four digits of my phone number. And phone numbers are, you know, unless you pay for them for 1-800 numbers, phone numbers are actually meant to be random. And so the trick here is that with 6514, you can memorize 6514, but you don't quite find a rule. You can't really find a rule. And why does this matter? Well, it matters because in machine learning, what we're trying to do is we try to take in data that we haven't seen and then sort of apply what we've learned from the data we have seen to it to make a prediction. And let's do that right now. So for the first sequence, if I gave you the number 100,000, 
you would say, yeah, I know the rule, it's plus two. So the next number is 100,002. But for the second one, you couldn't say anything because all you know is 6514. You memorized that sequence. So you don't know what the next number would be, 400,000. So there's a difference here that concerns memorization versus finding a rule. And the question is, and this is what we're gonna explore in the next couple of slides is, how do you measure the, this difference? But you see right there that for 2468 versus 6514, the data already indicates, you know, the, the best thing you could say about the second sequence is, I don't have enough data yet. In order to understand what happens here, what the brain there actually does, is we have to look at what we actually do in general. And that's actually as general as the scientific method itself. Um, the scientific method itself was basically, um, we have some experiments, you know, an apple fell on somebody's head. <clears throat> And he said, well, okay, why does it hurt? And does it hurt more if the apple is higher? And does it hurt more if the apple is thicker? And he just uh, dropped apples. Um, of course, I'm trying to make a story out of Isaac Newton, but the reality is that we have experiments and then you take these experiments, they give us observations. These are the observations, if you have enough of them, hopefully give us a theory, a formula like E equals MGH from Newton, such that we don't have to do these experiments anymore. We learned something so we can predict the outcome of those experiments. And this is not only a very old process, it's actually even animals do it, right? Pavlov's dogs, like when the bell rings, they predict there's gonna be food because there's enough repetition for that. So why do I even go that deep? Well, I go that far back because we have the theory um, um, today and we still have the experiments today, except we also have computers. And in the 1950s, they decided, hey, wouldn't it be cool if when the experiments are dangerous or expensive or both, like nuclear explosions, wouldn't it be cool if we just take the theory, simulate, and then see if the observation kind of matches what we expect. And so in the 1950s, we started using computers for simulation, which is basically, we give it the predictions of our theory and see what happens to observe. But what's really, now knew is that we decided someone, I think around the 2000s, that we could actually take observations, just the observations, put it into machine learning, and then get predictions. And that ultimately means the machine forms the theory, not us, okay? It ultimately means you have a neural network with 100,000 parameters, and it has some way of predicting what you wanted to predict, but you don't know anymore what, what, what's going on. Unless, you know, well, unless what? Well, unless actually we apply the same rules that we developed over, I would say thousands of years to build theories to machine learning. And for me, by the way, that is one of the core things of data science. It's the science of automating the scientific method, right? Because physicists and other scientists have known to build models for hundreds of years. But the news now is that we're trying to build these models automatically. So let's take a closer look at this and we'll directly derive where I'm going from actually the scientific process. So the scientific process used to be, you take some bunch of measurements and for the sake of uh, simplification, but also I think it's not that much of a simplification, we'll put them into a table. So, you know, there's a reason why Excel is a table or, or you know, databases are mostly relational databases or tables. So what we do is we have some experimental factors and we put them each into a column and then we have some outcome, right? So um, for example, uh, I don't know, is the, is the, is the you know, is it, will the rat die or is the rat alive, right? Based on, you know, amount of dosage I, I give of different chemicals could be one thing. So ultimately I have experimental factors in those columns and then each row represents an experiment and I write down the outcome into the last column. That's uh, how we're gonna look at this for the rest of, the, of this talk. And so it used to be, you know, people collect all this data and then some brain or some set of brains looks at the data, plots them, does some math, figures something out and comes up with a really smart way of modeling this, for example, using a formula. And you know, if the formula is simple enough and the, and the uh, 
thing you're describing is impressive enough, then, you know, maybe E equals MC squared, you're Einstein. And then obviously you become famous. So that, that is used to be the scientific method and, and uh, how it's done. Now, what's new? Well, what's new is we exchange the brain with a finite state machine. Because whatever you do in a computer, whether it's a neural network or a random forest or, or decision tree or some support vector machine, ultimately you're implementing that thing on a finite state machine. You know, and even if it's a Google compute cluster that has how many CPUs and GPUs, doesn't have unlimited memory, so it stays and is a finite state machine. Yes, with a bunch of states, but it's still a finite state machine. And the good news about that, if you think about it, is that, you know, humbly, I spent a lot of years understanding finite state machines as, as a computer scientist. So we should ask ourselves, what can we say about this finite state machine that is trying to model the table? And also, we should kind of put this into the framework of intelligence. And so here's some definitions that come handy. I, I don't want anybody to, to memorize them right away, but it's, it's kind of just to get more intuition about what's going on. First of all, oh, intelligence. Well, intelligence is the ability to adapt. There are many, many definitions, but I'm taking this definition because not only is it the first from Binet and Simon in 1904, and basically the creators of the IQ test, but also it works with us, okay? So what it does is what we can say is that machine learning adapts a finite state machine to an unknown function based on observations. So what happens here is that table that has the experimental columns and the outcome, we kind of assume, and it's really an assumption, um, that it's a mathematical function, that these are samples of a mathematical function. Something input, you know, gives some output. And from now on, we will say that the input is n rows of observations, right? So each row is an instance. Instance is the machine learning term for an observation. And um, it has a header x1 to xm and f of x, obviously of the vector, is, is the outcome, okay? And that outcome we'll call target function. And so what we want is we want a state machine m that adapted to the table such that given the input, we get the output. There is obviously more to it because we'll see that in a second. We want even that similar input gives us the right output, but we'll go there in a second because that's called generalization. So let's just think about this for now. So we just assume we have some data, which is, you know, just real value numbers, it could also be strings, it could also be categories, whatever. Let's just call it data. But if, if you want to think mathematically, they just make it any numbers in those, in those experimental factor columns. And then to make things easier right now, but it is not a requirement in general, it's just for right now, we'll say the outcome is binary. And we also say that the outcome is balanced. So basically you'll have cat, not cat, or cancer, non-cancer, or dead, alive, survived, not survived, something like this that is just binary. And we'll also assume that you have as many instances or, or samples or observations that are, the, the, uh, uh, that are you know, one class and uh, the, as, as the other class. So you have as many survived as you have dead, or you have as many cats as you have non-cats. So as you have that, we should ask ourselves, if I was to create a finite state machine, how would this finite state machine actually look? Like we do it by hand, okay? We, we, we right now don't care about any algorithm, like not no neural networks or anything. We just care about the arrows you would draw on a finite state machine. A finite state machine is a very simple thing. You'll see that on the next slide. It really just takes input, arrow, output, okay? So let's think about it. The first finite state machine that I could draw is one where I just take the inputs x1 to x5 and map them to an output, right? And then they take the next input for the next row and map that to the output of the next row and so on. And I do this for each row. So in this case, for this particular table, I would have six arrows for six rows. And it's cool because now I actually, you know, by the way, if you wanted to do this for real, you could just make this if then, right? So if the first row of inputs, then 
the first row of output, right? And so on and so forth. So if I created a bunch of if thens or arrows for each such that each row has one of them or each row has one arrow, what I would get is obviously perfect translation of the table. The accuracy is perfect. You know, every time you see the same data again, you get the same output. Perfect. But the problem here is it's it's a lookup table, right? It's a dictionary. It's basically exactly get the input, reduce the output. So if you did this for a cat versus dog problem or a cat not cat problem, the cat would have to be pixel identical to the cat you know that you're going to predict. Um, I mean, basically that's not useful because otherwise, like if one pixel changes, you can't predict the cat anymore. It's basically just a lookup. That means why we have perfect, uh, why we have perfect accuracy, we have no generalization. We want generalization. We want that small changes in the data don't change the output. It still goes like, yeah, just because the cat is like, the head is looking down, we still want to say it's a cat, right? Well, before we go there, let's think about what this means for the table, right? So another way we could model the finite state machine is instead of giving each row an arrow, we only give the whole thing one arrow, okay? So we say, take any input and my output is one, okay? That's super cool because now I can handle any input, you know? Any cat will be a cat, but also any dog will be a cat or anything else for that matter. And obviously, sometimes you have problems where you have training that are like 90% of one class, 10% of the other class. Yeah, you can easily get 90% accuracy by just guessing that majority class. It's called a best guess. So in our case here, that's interesting because what we have is we have the most generalization. We know we have perfect generalizations, but it's overly general. Overly general also exists. It's not just memorization and overfitting. It can also be overly general. Um, overly, overly general happens a lot in humans. Just, you know, an example of that is racism, okay? So what happens here is any row one is a perfect way of dealing with a table such that any input gets you an output, but your accuracy is bad. But this is interesting. So if we use as many arrows as we use rows, then we'll get to um, overfitting or just memorizing, no generalization. But if you just use one arrow, we get to no accuracy, but we get to maximum generalization. And of course that suggests that the actual solution should be in between, right? So what you want is you want enough arrows that you can have high accuracy and the least amount, but you want to get away with the least amount of arrows such that you can still generalize. And the typical you know, idea here, how this would look like is that you find a rule that is a commonality between the rows, in this case, one, four, and six, which all are zero. And you find another rule that, that just says not this in binary, it's easy. You just have to say everything else. Or if it's multi-class problem, you would also have to find a rule for, for you know, why is it one, one, one. And now the question obviously is, huh, how do I actually get to the optimum amount of arrows versus accuracy, right? And of course, yes, um, that theory doesn't solve that like this. It's still an optimization problem. But interestingly enough, we know a little bit, um, and that's based on information theory. We know a little bit of how this actually behaves if the data was on the left completely random and uh, the, the target function was completely random, it actually follows this curve. Um, so what happens again on what you see here is 100% accuracy on the left for, for complete, uh, each row has an arrow. And then as you quantize, which means you get rid of arrows, um, you'll get to, well, in this case, zero accuracy, which is not right because you always get to just best guess, but you get to, to zero, uh, basically zero information, that's, that's what this says. Uh, because obviously if everything is one, there's no surprise. And so you basically, you basically, you basically go down that curve. Um, and what's interesting here is again, as we're talking about, for example, noisy data, it turns out just in that knee, you'll find the signal to noise ratio because what you really want is that you store that rule in your machine learner and you generalize away the noise, right? Um, 
So, but this obviously only works for completely random data and it won't work for anything, um, you know, real because the point is, as, it, as it's real, it may have following a completely weird curve, um, which is upper bounded by this curve, but it may not help you. But the interesting part is that we have a trade-off between generalization and accuracy. And we can actually modify our generalization by making the machine learner sp sparser, by actually making it having less state transitions, okay? Um, and let's just give an intermediate summary here. What this means in practice is, first of all, we already know that memorization is worst case generalization. So overfitting <laughs> is not a good thing, okay? And basically what it means is if you deduce nothing from the data, the only thing we can do is memorize the observations verbatim, six, five, one, four. You can't do anything with that yet. You always have to remember something first, but it's also interesting once you have two, four, six, eight, once you have the rule plus two, you don't have to remember how you learned the rule. You just need the rule. And in fact, if you go back in your own brain, how many things that you actually can do, you, you remember how you learned them. Usually you don't, you just know what it is. And that's obviously, again, a compression mechanism in your brain that just tries to get rid of connections or the state transitions to make, to make things just as efficient as possible. So, and as many parameters as needed for memorization is therefore an indicator that the machine learner did not deduce anything, right? Um, and so overfitting and reducing parameters below the memorization capacity will in the best case, make the machine learner forget what's not relevant with regards to the target function. So I skipped a little bit ahead here because I talked to you about parameters already, when in reality, we haven't even, we should, we should talk about how we actually go from those arrows that are just painted to the uh, to actual parameters, but in a, in a sec. Before I go there, by the way, what I'm telling you here is that you need to sort of reduce, uh, you know, the complexity of your model to be more general while keeping the highest accuracy is completely not new. It's called Occam's razor. And it just says among competing hypotheses that are correct, uh, the ones with the fewest assumptions should be selected, you know. And it is basically the shortest explanation wins, the shortest model wins. And it's kind of funny, I, I love, love to put this slide on because Wikipedia has an explanation for why. And if you read the, if you read the second explanation, you know exactly why uh, you want Occam's razor. Um, I'm not sure Wikipedia intended that. It's, it's, a, it's, a funny, it's a funny joke here. Like for each accepted explanation of a phenomenon, there may be an extremely large, perhaps even in terms of a number of possible more complex. Yeah, just... Uh, Keep it too short, keep it short. So how do we get from those arrows that I was just trying to minimize to actually a concrete algorithm like a neural network, a random forest or, or, or a decision tree? And the trick here is that there is a little thing called entropy that um, means I don't actually have to go from those arrows to the neural network, or I have to go from those arrows to a decision tree or, or a random forest. I don't have to know how to make this transition. It's really funny. All I have to know is how to measure the complexity for the one and for the other, and then I can compare. And in order to get there, let's revisit a little bit how bits work, okay? So basically a bit is defined as the outcome of a coin toss, right? So an experimental outcome has the information content of one bit, if and only if, there are only two possible outcomes and each outcome is equiprobable, which often is used as, or oh, we don't know what the probability distribution is. And this is the case because remember, we have data on the left. We don't know anything about the data. If we had a model for the data, things would completely change, but we're trying to build a model, okay? Which what it means is that um, barring catch 22, we need to assume that the, uh, that the target function, uh, the distribution of those zeros and ones is basically our information bottleneck. So what it means is if you have equiprobable zeros and ones, like we just assumed, as I said earlier, that means that each row of outcome in our table would be one bit of information, 
Because again, we don't know how to go from the data, from the input to the output, but we have an e equal amount of zeros and ones. So that means um, each row of the table gives us one bit. And of course, you can totally uh, generalize this to more than binary, and you can totally generalize this to more than, um, uh, uh, sorry, more than more than uh, equidistribution. It could also be. So the, all of this is possible. We just don't go there right now. But what we haven't said yet is, okay, so we know now in, in this particular table that I had there with the six outcomes, this is six bits worth of outcomes, right? Um, but how do we get to, to how big of a machine learner I need for that? Well, for that, um, we can take um, definitions that were basically, they're not from me, they're just in the literature, for example, from David McKay. It's a very, very good book, it came out 2003. And you can say, well, let's call it intellectual capacity. So each, each um, and a machine learner should have some capacity, right? Some, something it can do. So it's the number of unique target functions a machine learner is able to represent, right? As a function of the number of model parameters. And then we can define something that's very interesting. We can say, well, a machine learner's intellectual capacity is memory equivalent to n bits when the machine learner is able to represent all two to the power of n binary labeling functions of n uniform random inputs. So basically what this is is, I have six bits of outcomes in this particular table down there, right? So what it means is my machine learner, if it has six bits of what's called memory equivalent capacity, then I can guarantee that this machine learner has the capacity to memorize the table. That's great, but here's the problem. We don't wanna memorize, we want to generalize. Well, what that just means is that you should use a machine learner that has less memory equivalent capacity or the smallest amount of memory capacity to actually learn that table. And that right there gives you a measure of generalization, right? So if you had a balanced binary classifier, then again, each row is one bit and the memory equivalent capacity is, is also measured in bits. So what you get is uh, bits per bit, which is nothing else but a compression ratio. So how, how well were you able to compress this table with your finite state machine. And obviously, if that number is smaller or equal one, then you're using more arrows, <laughs> or smaller than one, they're using more arrows than you had rows in your table. That's not a compression. But if you use a lot less arrows than you have rows in your table, then you have uh, some kind of generalization. Now, I need to skip over a very interesting fact that that generalization actually has a dependency on the dimensionality of the problem. Um, which is seen here as GMEM, but that would take way too long to explain. Um, but it's really nice that we have a handle on that because that makes us able to actually deal with high dimensional problems much easier than um, if I didn't think this way. But there's a big thing that we're still missing. How do we calculate the memory equivalent capacity of a machine learner? Well, it's actually not so hard if you think of a decision tree, it's just the log two of the number of leaves. You know, that's what I can memorize. Um, in a neural network, I'll show you a little bit how we do it. Again, there's an, a demo app that I can show you. Um, and we also did this in, in my startup for random forests uh, because these are sort of an industry more, more practical. Um, there's a bunch of research to be done. I don't know uh, to, how to do it for support vector machines uh, or, or Kenyon's nervous GMMs. To pick your machine learner that you want to know to see where is actually based on the number of parameters the point of overfit it would be interesting to see. So uh, if you want to just do it for neural networks, turns out there's four rules. Um, I don't want to go into the uh, into the rules in detail because that will take a while. But the trick here is this: um, if you see neurons as memory then it's pretty clear that if you have two neurons in parallel, they add up. It's just like two hard disks. If you have two hard disks, each one gigabyte, then you have a two gigabyte you know, storage now. So if you have uh, three, three bits of memory in a neuron and you add another neuron, it just makes it six bits of memory. Now that's the neurons in parallel. If you have neurons in series, you can actually just follow, uh, it's called the data processing inequality. And that's the same as saying, okay, I have a hard disk with a gigabyte storage, but I only have 10 bytes to store. Well, how much information do you have? Well, 10 bytes. 
there's the, the rest of the gigabyte is unused. And the same happens with neurons. If neurons depend on other neurons, the, the capacity that's used of the second layer is only as much as the output from the layer before. Um, and this, a bunch of this work is absolutely not for me because McKay already showed that for, for a single perceptron. Tishby wrote a whole book on, on sort of the, the information bottleneck and data processing inequality. And um, then McKay speculated how to do this in actual uh, neural networks. And then um, I had a postdoc together that actually we both sort of went through the math and also um, empirically to see that, yeah, it actually just behaves the way I said. So if you, if you, uh, if you look into this, you'll see that you can have, for example, this perceptron here, the first one on the left, will have three bits of capacity because it has three parameters, two weights and a bias. And then you can just go through these and, and just count. Really, you get eight bits of memory equivalent capacity for this. Or if you have a typical deep learner, again, I'm skipping over this because um, it will take too much time. Um, then you, you, you can totally just basically treat them like a circuit and get 10 bits uh, as a result. And that means this particular neural network here, whatever its weights are, it can memorize 10 rows of any table that has balanced binary labels, okay? It's absolutely overfitting if it was 10 rows. If it was 100 rows of a table with that neural network, you would have a generalization of uh, 100 to 10 or 10 to 1, obviously, which is nice. Then you actually probably found a rule. And if you want to try all of this out, there's this app, tfmeter.icsi.berkeley. .edu and, and you can just basically go and, 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 and see how sort of on the left, there's even an idea of like how much capacity demands this, this takes. And then you can build your network and press train. Now this is uh, uh, a response from us to, to Stanford. Stanford created the TensorFlow Playground. You might've seen this before. And we just basically said that that's a cool tool, but we'd rather embed some measurements so you actually know what to build. Um, so in the end, what I pre presented here is that machine learning basically becomes an engineering discipline. You count bits left and right. Basically left is in the table and right is in your machine learner, okay, right? And you'll find out that once you do that, that any machine learner can overfit. That means any machine learner has a memory equivalent capacity and it can be absolutely sometimes computed analytically and otherwise you can measure it. Um, and uh, in, in the case of neural networks um, that have gating functions, not linear functions, you, there's four rules. You get, very, get there very easily, but it also means now you can actually compare different architectures. It also means now you can, can, can build neural networks from scratch, basically, okay, how much more information do I need to model? Do I need another neuron or not, right? Um, you get task independent uh, comparison of networks. Um, and there's also a way to actually predict the capacity requirement approximately. Um, but again, that uh, I don't have enough time to, to, uh, to explain, um, but that, that is obviously powerful. So you can see whether you can do something. There's other stuff you could do with memory equivalent capacity. You can take 5%, 10%, 20%, and so on of the data and see if you actually converge. Do you have enough data? So the reason why we don't yet have a COVID vaccine for under 12 year olds and why it's delayed is because the FDA and Pfizer didn't agree on how many people should we actually test. Well, I have some ideas of how they should have calculated it rather than you know uh, discussed on on this, because what you do is you you take you take your your table that you have, take five percent, ten percent, twenty percent, and so on on it, and if you're memorizing, then what you will see is that your curve just goes up linearly because memory. The more storage you do, the more uh, storage you use, the more storage uh, you need, right? The more data you add, it's just linear. It just adds, okay? But if you actually found a rule like two, four, six, eight, ten 10 is plus two, then after two, four, six, eight, you know, you say the rule is plus two, you converge on the amount of memory you need to store, um, you know, in your machine learner. And so you can totally find out if I uh, have an approximation of how much data do you need. You can also use this generalization measure to actually get average resilience of noise in decibel. Uh, I can't explain that either right now. And then 
Uh, also, you can measure bias with that because what you can do is you can feed it random inputs and hope that you also get random outputs. Because if you don't, you'll see that um, you actually have a bias towards whatever the non-randomness is. Um, yeah, and so now I get to the so what. I know I, I have to apologize because I skipped over a bunch of things. Um, I just gave you the main idea, honestly, because I actually have a, a 294 seminar on this, which where, where it takes me like a whole semester to explain this sort of in the in the right way. But I can tell you what measuring and mesh for information learning actually does. It allows you to measure the learnability of the data, including do I have enough data? It means you don't have to actually guess hyperparameters anymore. You can determine the model architecture automatically. You build bespoke models from the ground up rather than saying, huh, AlexNet worked for them. Maybe it works for me too. It allows you to handle ultra wide data sets, which really behave differently than regular data sets. It allows you to generate results that are actually repeatable and reproducible because when you measure, you get always the same result rather than, oh, here's this random seed left and here's this random seed right. Uh, it also gives you a fast and unbiased ranking mechanism, which are even which I didn't even uh, discuss. And it allows it also allows to think in information terms. It allows you to do information preserving data pre-processing. So you have strings, you have booleans, you have all these different types. How do I convert them such that, you know, I get numbers, but their information content is preserved. Um, now, why do I tell you this? Because you can try this out. Um, basically pip install brainome is a tool that implements all of this stuff and more that I skipped over. Um, and it allows you to do basically, first of all, a bunch of measurements. And second, it allows you to run uh, basically like AutoML, but the difference between us and AutoML is, and we actually benchmarked this, is that our models are not only about 10 to 100 times smaller, they also train 10 to 100 times faster. And that means you don't need any cloud time. You don't have to ask Amazon anymore. We can just do this on our laptop. And we ran this just for validation on 180 uh, tasks uh, from OpenML based on an AutoML benchmark. And in 85% of the cases, our models are equal or better than the state of the art pre presented there, which is often of like 10,000 runs of trying to uh, do hyperparameter tuning. All of this, by the way, that I'm saying is reproducible. You can take a look at, at this GitHub. It has all the results. Um, and it allows you to, to basically create, create models where there's a much higher chance that we actually get at the theory that's in the model. Because remember, we're kind of replacing that human brain. But other things were really interesting. If you don't just do OpenML, um, and because also this is a Citrus Health talk, is because we can be now really fast and quick and doing some machine learning, we can just take data sets that usually take a lot longer to, to deal with and run through them. So we decided, let's take the uh, cancer genome atlas where you have cancer and non-cancer uh, uh, gene expressions. And these gene expressions are 21,000 columns, okay? I mean, this is a really large dimensionality. Um, and we created a 34 class problem and just ran with it. And we got 90% accuracy um, where the best case would be 11. Um, and this is actually not something I just did, but we worked together with people who actually know a lot more about this at Seta Sinai. Um, and they said, hey, let's create a table like this, which literally is the gene expressions highlighted that are um, make that cancer. And, and of course, the end goal at Seta Sinai is to actually have a blood test for cancer, to actually go in and, and you know, you, you go and have your your uh, physical and you do STD test and you do your cancer test, just like, you know, way before you could even detect anything. I mean, that's their work. But what we did is to actually go and, and say, well, you don't have to wait years to build these models. Let's just build them. Um, so obviously it's onto them now to confirm that these results are right, but they embedded a bunch of test genes in here that they know are right and we found them. Another uh, person we work with is, is, is uh, Zong up in, in LBL in the Joint Genomic Institute. And he um, has another data set that has just 71,266 features. And uh, the question here is uh, 75% is, uh, is basically some, it's two class problem is you have inflammatory bowel disease or not, uh, or you're healthy. 
And in 15 minutes on a laptop, uh, we generated a random force that achieves 99% TPR uh, for IBD and 95% TPR for healthy. Um, and it has a huge generalization of that huge data set. It's, it's only 12% uh, of the, of the data is memorized, or it will be, uh, uh, you know, 6027 divided by 12% of uh, 1627, um, which I have to do the math right now. But basically you get a very small model. Uh, this is smaller than hundred kilobytes. And we identify that about 200 of these gene expressions are important to look at. And now you might say, okay, that's all cool, but maybe um, we just use a lot of compute. We just use, um, you know, we don't need to, to be on my laptop. I have enough time on EC2. They gave us all for free. Well, yeah, but what's interesting is if you think about the next generation of computer, and, and we're also working with IBM on this, is they do have quantum machine learning at this point. They actually know how to build a, a neural network on, uh, on a quantum computer. The problem is the neural network right now is two neurons. Well, why? Because we have a limited amount of qubits. Well, but if we knew how many bits we need and if we can actually build a neural network automatically, then we can not only serve as a gating function, say this data set would work on quantum and this not, but also we just build it on the quantum computer automatically and uh, run it there. And so this is some work uh, that, I'm, that we're also doing right now. So in general, MEC and, and information measurements give us a handle on the size uh, of the network. It gives us a handle on hyperparameter tuning and they're basically just good engineering, okay? They're not as sexy as, oh my God, what does this network do? Let's do all these analysis. But they give us good engineering. They give us stuff where you can just go in and say, this is gonna be the size as an upper limit. You don't need more than that. And I can already tell you, and just as a, as a short version, um, Kolmogorov showed in 1956 that three layers are enough for neural networks. And you, yes, you need these convolutional layers to actually cut down on noise very easily. But the decision layers, you only need three. And actually you only need a logarithm amount of neurons in the hidden layer and logarithm, uh, logarithm in the number of instances you're trying to train. Um, it's, it, we really don't need 100 million parameter networks. We probably need 100 uh, parameter networks in many of the cases. So um, that's what it is. Um, any questions? <laughs> Gerald, thank you very much. A wonderful approach to giving us the basics on machine learning and very rapidly moving the conceptual model uh, through so many layers, and we know that you spend literally semesters uh, teaching and training individuals in this. So thank you for taking us through that and then to the very practical examples. Uh, we would encourage questions. We can, we have a few minutes for questions at this point. Uh, I would like to start with one, Gerald, in terms of more of the practical applications as you just put forward, two specific elements to that. You've given three models within Citrus uh, Health that we've been looking at with you, but could you share uh, what you, number one, feel are some of the most um, relevant or opportunistic areas that your modeling could next be applied to? A lot was with genomics and very large data sets that you're trying to reduce. Could you give a few more examples that you think need attention or could very much benefit from this? And the second yeah. side, let's go beyond health. Uh, when we take a few minutes, because we have a very broad range of individuals on uh, attending today, mm -hmm. if you could say, what are some of the other areas, um, particularly across our citrus health ecosystem in, in terms of some of the robotics, our sustainable infrastructure, our climate areas that you have also seen come forward. So please. So I, I see this tool, especially the Brainome tool, um, uh, I, there's also actually questions that I'm, I'm going to answer after that. But I see the Brainom tool as something where you basically, first of all, it gives you a, a really good baseline, okay? I usually call this tool a quick snap, okay? So you can take a data set, again, even a complicated large dimensional data set, and run it and get an accuracy, and you have some baseline right there. Now, maybe, unfortunately, the tool just gave you 98%, and you need 99%. 
well, then you can tune and, and, and you know, work on this. And in similar ways, um, a, the cameras in our cell phone allowed us to take pictures ourselves. You know, in the 1900s, we had to hire a photographer just to do a family picture. Now we have to hire a data scientist just to do some simple analysis. And I think um, also given the sparsity of availability of data scientists, um, what we can do now with, with a tool like this is we can just have a biologist run a first run on this. Have, you know, whoever you want, if you're not in the field of machine learning, you can do machine learning now, okay? But there's still gonna be cases where you hire a photographer and there's still gonna be cases where you absolutely need a data scientist, where these automatic measurements are just not the right thing to do. And obviously these are usually the interesting cases. And at this point also, um, to also answer uh, Maxwell's question, um, uh, right now this only does classification, right? So what do you do for regression? Um, is a good question. Um, I would love to work on extension of the theory to regression. Um, it's, it's, not, it's not clear um, how this works one-on-one. -on -one. But for now, um, classification obviously is also like 80 to 90% of what people do, right? And especially multi-class, um, I didn't touch on it, but it's totally within the range of, of what this is this year. Um, yeah, sure. Uh, uh, David, should I go to the next questions in the chat? Uh, yes, I think that uh, Andra asked uh, in a different okay. way, uh, the same area that I did. Uh, sh her question is when you mentioned dimensionality, are yeah. problems in robotics where you have the real world or real time interaction uh, also applicable? And can you give an example? Yeah, so uh, this is very interesting to ask how, uh, this is kind of a, a cool dual question. First of all, dimensionality. So we actually do really, really, really well with physical data. So there's a Higgs boson data set that we really just go through and, and uh, we use as like our showcase because we're really fast and really small network and, and better answer than the original paper. Um, so whatever is physical works really well. Also, we, I mean, this is sort of not official, but inofficial, the bit is a physical unit and the bit is uh, completely compatible with the SI system, okay? And so the interesting part is that these measurements are not just random metrics I came up with. These measurements are com compatible to the physical world. And the, the um, when you mentioned dimensionality, uh, so real-time interaction, these kind of things um, are possible, obviously, because you can just run the tool again and again and again. Um, so th the physical work works really well, um, is, is my answer for that. Um, Beyond that, it's hard for me to say, Andra, because I don't know exactly what problem you're thinking about it. Um, but of course, it's fast, so real time is easier, right? Well, again, this gets to the point that we would like to look at these applications and part of Citrus is to take concepts that work in one area and see how they can be broadly applied and, again, the generalization to other uh, specific engineering issues. Um, well, very go ahead, Gerald. I mean, anybody who needs to know, do I have enough data, especially when data collection is expensive, you know, the, 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 uh, the capacity progression gives you an answer right there, right? So it's, by the way, the answer is never as clear as you saw on my slide. It's usually in between because it's real world, um, but it does help. And it does also help for feature engineering. So it's not just a tool again that it's, it's in some ways it's a quick snap for anybody who wants to do machine learning who doesn't uh, want to uh, you know go if too much entry barrier with like learning AutoML and stuff. Um, at the other hand, it's it's a measurement tool. Once you understand these measurements, uh, for me it's kind of funny. I don't even know how I spent my career not using those measurements. Once once you have them, it's like you really want them. Um, so it's vertical in the sense like everybody who does machine learning, um, I encourage to take a look at that. Um, and then Zong right. had a question. Yes, please. It's a, a wonderful question because it asked it in the opposite way in the case of where Brainome AI did not generate better accuracy. So are there areas that you would suggest or does it imply uh, you should not use this model? Well, I mean, there are a bunch of areas we can't do yet, including regression, um, right? So that the, the theory isn't there yet, just like I, I told Maxwell. And the other thing is uh, time-based data. We're we right now just, you know, you, if you can fit it in a table as time-based data, that obviously works. But I think most of the AutoML tools have 
have not much nicer ways of, of dealing with time-based data than we have, or if they have any way, it's nicer because we have no way. So the, these would be limits right now that we, we still have. Um, and then also um, sometimes if you really know your use case, right? So for example, if you actually do image classification, well, yeah, AlexNet is a good choice, right? It's not, not a bad choice. Um, but also on that note, um, people use the convolutional part of AlexNet and then just have us build a decision layer and that actually worked a little better than the original. So um, there, are, there are a bunch of things that, that obviously aren't solved. I mean, I'm mostly saying that I'm very surprised that things like AutoML, they just guess and check through the algorithms um, but in reality, when you build something like a kitchen, a house, a boat, a, a f airplane, anything, when you build something, you're engineering. And when you're engineering, engineering starts with measurement, you know, measure twice, cut once. But when we build a model, why don't we measure the model, right? And that's basically, you know, where I'm coming from. Uh, measurements are just so universal, yet for some reason, we, we're trying to be completely empirical and just like, push it out there and hope it works. Right. Well, Gerald, that's a, a perfect note on which we should uh, close. We want to make sure that everyone who's attending today knows that not only is the program recorded and you can turn back to it, we want to again thank our colleagues from our other campuses who always join us. And please do uh, use this as an opportunity to reach out to uh, Dr. Friedland and his uh, expertise in this area as he is looking for new ways to apply it and has been wonderful. His uh, seminar is oversubscribed for this fall and we are very excited to be working on a number of projects with him. So again, Gerald, thank you very much for starting us on our whole series. Uh, as I, we mentioned at the beginning, uh, the Citrus Research Exchange continues throughout the fall. We will skip one week, but please look at the list, we have just an outstanding group of individuals presenting on so many different areas of innovation, technology, data science. So with that, we'd like to thank you all. Thank Dr. Gerald Friedland for his outstanding presentation. And we wish you all a good day and look forward to you joining us in the future. Thank you very thank you. much.